Good morning. Will you turn your Bibles with me to the book of Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 18 this morning. But I suppose maybe a something that's not as exciting as our parking lot uh, this past week starting is the knowing and understanding that Tuesday is April 15th and all of us have to be aware of the requirement it is as citizens of this country to pay our taxes. You can see the graphic behind us. A, a fellow is getting audited by the IRS and he says, man, I owe that much. Well, how much would I owe if I turned in a friend? I, I think he would lose a friend if, if that were the case. But there's a story of the IRS checking up on a, a Christian man who had, had given on his, at least on his tax return, had made a $10,000 contribution to his congregation. And so the IRS was fishy about not just that, but some other things. And so they called the local preacher and said, preacher, did, did Mr. Thompson give a gift of $10,000 to the church last year? And the preacher, you could tell, didn't know quite what to say. He, he kind of muffled the words. And, and so the IRS fellow said, well, I'll ask you again. Did Mr. Thompson give $10,000 to the church last year? And the preacher finally figured out what was going on. And, and he said, he certainly will. And so that, I suppose, was a pretty good response. But there's a, a story also of the owner of a, a sandwich shop, a deli restaurant, and he was being audited by the IRS and being questioned for his tax return. And, and so he had reported a net profit of, for last year of $80,000. And so the, the fellow being audited asked the IRS man, well, why don't you people just leave me alone? I work like a dog. My wife and my children, we all work in the restaurant. We only take off three days a year. And all we've cleared is $80,000. And the IRS man looked at him and said, Sir, it's not the net profit that we're concerned about. It's those deductions. You listed six trips to Bermuda for you and your wife. And the fellow said, Oh, yeah, I forgot to tell you, we also make deliveries as well. Benjamin Franklin said, there's nothing more certain than death and taxes. But another fellow said, but at least death doesn't get worse every year. But we understand that as Christians, we do need to pay our taxes. The Bible does say in Romans chapter 13, verse number 1, let every soul be subject to his governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. And in Romans 13, verse number 6, the Bible says, For because of this you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore all to that are due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs Fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. I've always wondered what it would be like if there was a David and Goliath situation today in the month of April, just before the tax deadline of April 15th. I don't know if you recall or not, but there's a small detail of motivation that's mentioned over in 1 Samuel 17 as they were trying to figure out who is going to go against this Goliath, this mighty Philistine, this big man. And so part of the motivation, all the men of Israel came together in verses 24 and 25 and said basically that whoever is willing to go against Goliath, the king will enrich him with great riches, will give him his daughter, and give his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. I would imagine there would be a long line of folks willing to fight against Goliath today as they are preparing to make their tax return. But this morning, as we are focusing in on Luke chapter 18, verses 9 through 14, we come to the parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Tax collectors in the first century being basically, in a sense, equivalent to the IRS, except for these fellows, they were, had a much worse reputation than even our tax collectors 
today. One of the scholars in, in writing about taxes in the first century and, and tax collectors has this to say. There were three taxes which every man had to pay in the first century. A poll tax for the privilege of existing. A land tax which consisted of one-tenth of the produce of his ground, either in cash or in kind. An income tax which was one percent of his income. Now that, that would have been pretty good. There was an import tax and an export tax. There was a tax for entering a br over or crossing a bridge. There was a tax for using main roads. There was tax uh, for uh, rolling down the, the, the road uh, with your animal cart. And the tax collectors, they could stop a man anywhere for any reason. And to make it worse, sometimes, if there was a poor man that could not pay his taxes, the tax collector would offer to advance him the money at quite a ridiculous rate of interest and so get him still further beyond. The crowning crime was generally these tax collectors who were Jews, who had sold themselves into the hands of the Roman government in order to make a profit out of misfortunes of their fellow countrymen. Public opinion classed together robbers, murderers, and tax collectors. So back then in the first century, the point is, tax collectors were some of the ha most hated men in society. And they were in the same category as murderers and robbers and, and other what we would think of as very grievous type sins. But in our text this morning, as we're coming to discuss and learn about the Pharisee and tax collector, we know that about Pharisees, Jesus had quite a bit of negative things to say about them throughout the New Testament. Initially, we may think that he's also going to come down rather harshly on this tax collector as well. But what Jesus says may actually surprise you. And the attitude of the tax collector may surprise you as well. I'm in Luke chapter 18, verse number 9. And Jesus spoke this parable. We know a parable is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so Jesus speaks this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, and even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, standing afar off, would not so much as even raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. As we're going to be making a couple of observations in just a moment, I'd like to make initially some points of emphasis as far as the contrast between this Pharisee and this tax collector. As far as the Pharisee is concerned, a Pharisee, he was a member of the extremely pious and religious sect of the Jews, priding himself on devotion to God and the Old Testament. The Pharisee was at home in the temple and he was present as a result of regular habit. He was not an extortioner. He was not unjust. He was not an adulterer. 
This fella even fasted two times a week and gave regularly as he was commanded under the old law. The publican, on the other hand, or the tax collector, as most translations say today, was a despised outcast, and he was basically considered an equivalent of those non-religious, faithless Gentiles. The tax collector was a stranger in the temple, and he was present as a result of desperation, not regular habit. But as we're going to pay close attention to this morning, there was quite a bit of difference between the attitude and the actions of this Pharisee and tax collector. First of all, as we're looking at focusing in on the Pharisee, we can see that his life and his actions and his attitude was filled with nothing more than haughty self-righteousness. And as we're considering these two men in the parable this morning, we, we are trying to figure out who it is that we may be most similar to, or better question, what it is that we know that we need to change in our lives. This Pharisee was filled with arrogance. As you can see, if he was telling, writing us today, the Pharisee would say, I, I am not arrogant. I, I'm just a lot better than you are. It, it's this attitude of haughtiness, uh, of arrogance, and, and maybe even the idea of slightly narcissistic as well, where he feels like everyone else is less than him. And the Pharisee feels like he can do no wrong, that he is the best of the best, and there is no one that even comes close to measuring up with me because of all of the good things that I have done. But as we look at the Pharisee's prayer in our text in Luke chapter 18, notice how he starts. It's kind of like a false start, a, a, a sense of, of, of fakeness in, in a way. He says that, I thank thee. But really, we get a sense that the Pharisee in this prayer, he's not talking to God as much as he is talking to himself and about himself. He's not thankful to God for anything as much as he is thankful for himself and all of these allegedly good religious things that he has done. This fellow, the Pharisee, he relies on a doctrine of good works that he deserves to be pleasing in God's sight because of all of the great things that he has done. And it's not that they, these Pharisees were bad people, but they knew that they were good. And as a result, they thought that everyone else around them was bad. But we are mindful of what the Bible says over in Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4, in which Paul says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. And in parentheses, we may add haughty self-righteousness as the Pharisee. But in lowliness in mind or of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for the interests of your own self, but also for interests of others. In this parable, the Pharisee was filled with haughty self-righteousness. However, secondly, the tax collector was filled with a humble self-reflection. And there is quite a bit of a difference in our attitude and our actions when we think about the Pharisee and this haughty self-righteousness and when we think about the tax collector being humble as he is self-reflecting upon God. And he, in his prayer, it's a very short prayer. It's not near as wordy or as lengthy or as, as extravagant as the Pharisee's prayer. But in a very concise, a very brief way. The tax collector lays it all on the line before God, and he says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Humility requires two things, among others. 
Humility requires for us to have a sense of our own inadequacy. And it also requires us to understand the enormous nature and consequences of sin. You see, when we're humble, we come to a point where we understand that we cannot do anything and everything by ourselves. But as we recognize our own inadequacy, we realize that we are not going to abuse others, but we're going to need others. And we're not going to think any less of them, but rather we're going to think more of them because they can help us and they can encourage us and they can build us up. And even even more important, as we think about our own inadequacy, not only that we need each other, but we need God as well. Because of sin, because there is nothing that we can do to forgive ourselves. Rather, we need God in our lives. We cannot do it all on our own. We need to humble ourselves in the sight of the Lord and understand that we have a problem with sin and that we need forgiveness of that sin and we need God's grace and we need His mercy as well. In the original text, the the translation in the Greek text It really says, says, God be merciful to me, the sinner. A sinner translates better in our English, but this tax collector was realizing that he's, he's not talking about anyone else except himself. He's not reflecting upon the sin of others. He's reflecting upon his own personal sin. And he's not simply placing himself as a sinner among others, and he's just as good or bad as everyone else. But in the original language, we get a sense of this true self-reflection. That this tax collector, even though of all of the past extortion and, and evil deeds and mistrust and taking advantage of others and taking their money and all of these things, he realizes that he himself was the chief of sinners. He's not just a sinner among many. But this humble self-reflection says, I am the sinner. It's sin in my own life. And I realize there's all kinds of other things going on in the world. But I have sin in my life. And I am the sinner in my own life. And I need to have the mercy from God. It doesn't matter how much you have sins in your own life. You can receive forgiveness from God by humbling yourself and by focusing on God's grace and His mercy. As we think about the Apostle Paul in his own life, one fellow has made some observations about how Paul had identified himself throughout Scripture. Early on, Paul in Galatians 1 verse 1, in which many believe was the earliest writing of the Apostle Paul, he refers to himself as Paul an Apostle. Later in his life and in other writing in his ministry, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15 verse number 9 identifies himself as the least of the Apostles, unfit to be called an Apostle. Over in a later writing in Ephesians chapter 3, verse number 8, Paul refers to himself as the least, the very least of all the saints. And over in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse number 15, towards the end of his life, way far separated from the beginning of his ministry, Paul identifies himself as the foremost of sinners. And so as we try to conclude these items, Paul begins by thinking of himself as an apostle. He he goes on to think that he is not worthy of this great office. He goes on further to think of himself as the least of all ordinary members of the church. And finally, he thinks of himself as the chief of sinners. You understand that Paul realized that, yes, he was an apostle called by God to do many great things. But Paul in his own life realized that he was not only a sinner, but the sinner, the chief of sinners. 
And he realized, just like everyone else that are Christians, that we need God's grace and we need his mercy. The Bible says in James chapter 4, verse number 6, that our God gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so as we conclude this morning, who do you identify with more? The haughty, self-righteous Pharisee or the humble, self-reflecting tax collector? A.B. Bruce writes this on how the Pharisee could have said his prayer if he was a whole lot less haughty and a whole lot more humble. The Pharisee could have said it this way. I thank thee that I have been preserved from extortion, but I confess I have coveted oftentimes what I have not laid my hands on. I thank thee that I am not an unjust man, but I acknowledge that I am far from being a generous person. I thank thee that I am not an adulterer, but I confess that my heart has harbored many wicked thoughts. I thank thee that my lot, my opportunities, and my habits differ widely from those of the class to which this man, my fellow worshiper, who beats his breast, belongs. But I do not flatter myself that I had been in his circumstances. I should have been better than he. And I deplore that I, in the class of which I am a member, feel so little compassion toward these much tempted men that we content ourselves simply abhorring them and holding aloof from their society. I thank thee that that is in my heart to attend punctually to my religious duties. But I acknowledge that my zeal and liberality come immeasurably short of what it needs to be. Now therefore, as the Pharisee could have prayed, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able to offer so willingly after this sort? For all things come of thee. What are my poor tithes to the liberality of King David? Or what my religious devotion compared to his whose whole heart was set upon building a temple for Jehovah, such as within those sacred precincts I now stand. You may identify more with the Pharisee being a very religious person trying to do as much good as possible. But regardless, and here's the main point for the message this morning, it doesn't matter how much you think you've done right, as in the case with the Pharisee. And it doesn't matter how much you think you have done wrong, as in the case with the tax collector. We all need to say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Jesus says in Luke chapter 18, verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be abased. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. This morning we are singing this song of encouragement. And this would be a great time for someone to become a Christian, having believing in Jesus Christ, being ready to turn away from those sins, to repent of all of those sins, to confess your faith that you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And with that confession and faith and repentance, being ready to be baptized into Christ, as the Bible says, to have all of your sins
washed away. If we can help you in any way this morning to become less like that Pharisee and more like that tax collector, recognizing that we all need the mercy of God. If we can help you in that way this morning, will you come forward while together we stand and sing?